Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning in this week. Great episode for you. As always, before I introduce the guest, I would just like to go over a few things. First, please follow, subscribe, rate, and review the show. It helps boost the podcast, grow the audience, and ultimately helps me get the best guests for you guys and just improve the show on a whole. Additionally, please go follow me on social media, R-O-Y-B-T-Z on Instagram and R-O-Y underscore B-N-T-Z on Twitter. There on Twitter, you can subscribe to the newsletter, which gives you access to updates, occasional blog posts, news about guests and the future of the show. And most importantly, you get the podcast conveniently into your inbox week in and week out. So go do that. Finally, please consider supporting this independent podcast. I made the decision not to work with any sponsors on this podcast at this moment in time. So I would like to be as independent as possible to be able to have the type of guests I want and the type of conversations that we have about anything and everything. So please consider supporting the podcast. Finally, if you want to start your own podcast, I have a full tutorial that covers everything you need to know, soup to nuts, A to Z, one to a hundred, everything you want to know about starting, growing, executing, marketing, reaching out to guests, why you should start a podcast, networking, really everything you want to know about starting a podcast conveniently in one easy to use, easy to read, easy to follow ebook. So go check that out. All right, let's move on to the guest. This week I have Jimmy Sonny. Jimmy is an author, speaker, speechwriter, and his latest book is The Founders, a story of PayPal and the entrepreneurs who shaped Silicon Valley. The book has gotten praise from Walter Isaacson, Nirial, and many more. It's a great book. And it's a super fascinating story. It's a company that everyone knows. Obviously, everyone knows Elon Musk. But in that time period between 1998 to 2002, there are so many intriguing stories. And this is why this is such a compelling book and episode. And that's why I wanted to have him on. So if you want to take the journey back into time and learn about PayPal, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, all these rock stars of tech, and how this company came to be, and all the great stories and insights that Jimmy was able to uncover in his five to six year research. Stay tuned to the episode. This is a great one. You're going to love it. So let's just jump right into it. Without further ado, let me introduce this week's guest, Jimmy Sonny. Enjoy the episode, everyone. The Genuinely Interested Podcast. And we're live. I hope, <laughs> Jimmy. How you doing? Nice to have you on the podcast. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Um, before we get into all the good stuff, I have to ask you a very important question. Who do you put your money on in a duel to the death? Putin or Elon <laughs> Musk? <laughs> That's a good. It's a good and very timely question. Um, uh, I think. I think it's. I think it's something that people want to know. Right. So I'll tell you a story that that emerges from the research on the book. Okay. Um, I I had uh, an interview with you know one of the people I interviewed was Peter Thiel, and we we were talking about this whole experience of PayPal and what it was like, you know, because he and Elon were at the, were at the company together at the same time. And one of the things he reflected back to me is he said, you know, one of the lessons I learned is never bet against Elon. And he said, it's, there's a reason why, like, I'm not, I think he said, I, I believe he said to me, like, there's a reason why it w- I invested in SpaceX and am not rushing to invest in other space startups. And he said, you just, you just don't get on the other side of him because you're going to lose. And uh, <laughs> I, I think I, I kind of, if I'm applying that lesson to this situation, um, you know, Putin has the judo experience, yeah. but uh, I don't think he bet against Elon. <laughs> so you're saying go all in on Elon? I mean, uh, other smart people have told me that, and I'll, I'll take their guidance on on that particular issue. Though, again, I'm not really qualified to, to say, <laughs> but but I'm going to take the advice of other people who you know, who have, who, who have pointed out to me his level of, uh, of endurance and the indomitable spirit that has, uh, that has, has propelled him to great success. 
Well, he's also got age, right? He's younger. He's 20 years younger. And I, I think right. I heard you tell a story that Elon Musk is actually a high-level street fighter player. Perhaps That's right. He, perhaps he can channel that energy from the game and, and somehow beat Putin, maybe. I mean, I feel like if you're that good at Street Fighter virtually, yeah. you're prob you've probably at least picked up a thing or two that can help you in street fights literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure that so many people think that and then they go into like an MMA gym and get their ass just handed to them. And they're like, <laughs> but in the game, I was great. I don't know why it doesn't translate over to the real world. Yeah. Well, you you know, you've got to get pretty good at grappling if it's on like an arcade or a console or <laughs> true, whatever, true. right? So you're you probably got unusually good hands, but maybe the rest of your body is atrophied a little. Yeah. And and for the people who are not on Twitter, uh, just so you get what we're talking about, the uh, Elon kind of challenged Putin to a duel, a fight. I'm not sure. It was very weird. But yeah, he, ch he challenged him on Twitter and uh, it kind of went viral. And that's what we're talking about. <laughs> I feel like, you know, one of the interesting things about it, and again, I'm not super active on Twitter, so I'm, I don't follow every bit of this. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, so it's not like I'm not, I'm also not in geopolitical world. And so I don't know how this affects everything. So like with all those disclaimers, I feel like, you know, we had an era in history in which duels were like an accepted thing. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you know, like, like Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, you know, like this is, this has the feel of, of like, uh, of like something you'd see in like, Downton Abbey or The Crown or something, right? Uh, like you'd see it in like a series, and and it's it's pretty interesting that you know what's old is new again, just on Twitter. That's true. And look, I mean, it's not a bad idea if that's what would stop these horrific things from happening across the world. Just two people fighting, and the winner, you know, it kind of gets to dictate. I mean, I guess there that that could there's things that could. You know, There's things have, that could go terribly, terribly, uh, terribly wrong. Terribly wrong, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I didn't, I didn't think that through, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, look, yeah. look your, your heart was in the right place, which is, I think everyone's hoping this ends quickly because there are people suffering because of it, right? So your, your, your target, I think, is the right one, which is uh, how does this thing come to a, a just and peaceful conclusion fast? I, I think that duels are probably not how it's going to happen much though we might you know want to see that i think i only thought of it uh from like elon's perspective like if he wins putin you know put you know he stops everything elon's the man but then like if putin wins oh no like yeah i didn't i didn't think that part through enough oh well um so you know the interesting the interesting thing though sure, is sure. is that this is actually a, related to this in some ways this wasn't my part of the history um, but you know, one of the things that happened in the early SpaceX days, and there's a really good book on the early SpaceX days that's written by an author named Eric Berger, uh, it's called Liftoff. And, you know, one of the things that happened is that Elon actually went to Russia, um, to try to, I believe, purchase like old rockets to see like, if that was a way to bring down the cost of space logistics and of space travel generally. Mm -hmm. So he's not, you know, he's, he's, uh, He's faced the Russians before. Uh, and what's interesting is that SpaceX has successfully reduced the cost of rocket launches and is trying to you know, create reusable vehicles. And again, I'm not the expert on this. I didn't study SpaceX. Sure. Eric Berger did. But his book lays out um, the, that process of, like, let's say, defeating the Russians, right? And so maybe like w that applies to this and we can get, some, uh, we can get a win here too. That'll be great, man. I uh, I think I speak behalf of half the world when I say like we we would love for this to stop. Um, all right, let's let's move, let's before we kind of get into PayPal and, and the story and your book and everything. I wanna I want the people to know a little bit more about you because you're not from tech, right? Like you're not an entrepreneur or investor. You're not from that space. You're a reporter and author, correct? Yep. So could you tell people a little bit more about, about you and, you know, how yeah. and the, I guess the journey leading up to writing this book? Yeah. And I would I mean, I, I think I should probably not claim the title of, of reporter. There are people who do that work every day who are very good at it. I'm an author. I write long form narrative nonfiction, meaning books of history that like don't feel like doing your history homework. Um, <laughs> and so so I had, a you know, the way I got to the PayPal project Again, it was it was pretty circuitous because I am not in tech. I don't write for tech. I mean, it's is not like my my beat. 
um, I had written a book called A Mind at Play. Okay. And as a part of doing that book, I looked at a place called Bell Laboratories really closely. And Bell Labs in the 20th century, like if you smash together like the biggest tech companies in the world, you know, that's Bell Labs in the 20th century. It's, it's, this exci- it's this an exciting place. It has a ton of resources. They invent the transistor, the laser. They actually oh. did improvements to the bazooka. Um, really? They did, I mean, they did everything, right? Wow. And they had this like massive collection of, of really talented people. You know, Alan Turing pops by for a visit during the war. And the guy I wrote about, Claude Shannon, is there. And I started to just like understand this place, you know, because you can't understand this person without the place that he worked. So I started thinking like, what are other places where that much talent has been in one place at one time? And PayPal seemed like a natural thing to me. It was like, oh, well, that's another example of like, you have a ton of really interesting people at one place at one time. And I started just like kind of noodling, like Googling, Wikipedia reading, right? Like I bought a few books and like, I just started thinking about it. And I started to realize like there was a story here, right? Um, Meaning that there was... There were interesting characters, right? Uh, people you knew, people you didn't know. Yeah. There was an interesting time and place. The late 1990s in Silicon Valley is this like crazy generative, like there's lots of stuff happening. Companies are rising, companies are falling. And you had drama, which is this company is created when the dot-com boom is happening, but it has to survive the bursting of the dot-com bubble September 11th the you know the country sours on tech for this period right because tech stocks are are sort of they're blamed for the decline in the in the markets and so you have like tension and drama um and then you have like what always attracts me is the story of how things are made right so what's interesting about paypal compared to like i don't know pets.com right is paypal is still around yeah and so 20 years later this company still exists that, that's like that's a long it's two, you know, two and a half decades, uh, two, 24 years at this point that this company has been around that, you know, companies from that era, like there were so many that ended up in the dustbin. So I was, and it was like, a, it's a product I use all the time and they yeah. own Venmo, which I also use all the time. Yeah. And so I thought to myself like, wow, not only is this group of innovators so interesting, meaning Max Levchin, David Sachs, Reid Hoffman, Elon, et cetera, and all of the people who work there, but they built something that endured. Right. So it's like, it's not the same as if you build something and then it sort of vanishes right off the face. I mean, I think there's moments where that's interesting too. But this to me was something about like, how did they build it? And then it lasted. Like, this is crazy. I would say that the final thing that kind of motivated it, the more kind of like Googling and like Wikipedia reading I did and like just like kind of diving into the story, I also discovered all of these people who are at the heart of the story that are not famous. Right. And so I think the temptation is to like look at the famous people and say, wow, this would be a great book. Like, to be honest, you know, and we're having like a little bit of a different conversation, your audience is a little different. Like, the more famous people get, the more restrained they get in what they say, is my experience. Yeah. That the bigger, the bigger they are, like, they have to stick to like an acceptable, with a few exceptions, uh, they have to stick to like an acceptable level of what they can and can't say. I found that the people that gave me the most interesting stories were the people who were early at PayPal, but they didn't have that. This was just a a company they worked at. It wasn't, you know, they weren't out for fame. I figured they'd have great stories to tell. The hypothesis ended up being true, and that's what led to the book. But the, the initial motivation was really just trying to understand, like, when you have groups of innovators together, what is that dynamic like and how do they get there? I think to your point, that's why Elon is so loved, I guess. I mean, also, I guess, hated as well. It's He's a controversial figure, but he does speak his mind. He is, he does go against the grain, you know, and again, this guy has a lot to lose as he's one, you know, top two richest people in the world, 70 million or so Twitter followers. Like he's a, you know, every tweet that he says is like CNN headlines, right? Yet he's just completely off the cuff. Un- at least that's what it seems like. Unfiltered, you know, king of memes and uh, <laughs> just says whatever he wants. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I'm not like the most active person on Twitter. Like when you oh, end up yeah. writing about history, you sort of have to block out certain things. But I will say this about him. He was incredibly forthright and very open in my interviews with him. So, you know, you can only judge someone by kind of in some ways by the experience you have with them, right? 
And in my experience with him, he never, he, he didn't shy away from a single topic I asked him about. And remember, I'm asking him about this moment that's actually quite painful for him. The creation of PayPal was a startup he made, but he was ousted in, in the middle of this story. And in spite of that, did not, he did not shy away from the discussion. He didn't, he didn't like say, you can write this, but you can't write this and whatever. He walked me through quite patiently his thinking about the company, like where it came from, his thoughts about recruiting, his thoughts about people, his thinking about innovation, the internet, finance, all of it. And never once said like, you know, well, make sure you don't do, you know, none of that. He was completely unfiltered, right? Um, uh, You know, cuss words and all. (laughs) (laughs) And so, so I, I do think that, you know, People admire that authenticity. You yeah. you will not find other public company CEOs communicating in the way he does. Now there might yeah. be some good things about that for some companies, sure. But it's also like the reason that he has a fan base and the reason he has a follower base is people feel like they're getting this from him, not from some fourteen step checklist that had to be approved by a VP of comms and then a person and then it had to be vetted by legal and disclaimer language. No, like he just does and says what he wants to say and do. And there's a real truth-telling component to it too, right? Like recently, I think he argued for the increase in production of oil and gas in the United mm-hmm. States as a hedge against Russia. He's the head of a company that builds electric cars. Like he's <laughs> clearly being honest when he's speaking against his own self-interest, right? Correct. Uh, saying like, hey, like we're going to have a, a capacity and supply and demand issue here. Like we got to, you know, and I didn't read the tweet again or follow it super closely. I'd heard about it through friends, but it says something when you're willing to speak out even against your own self-interest. It's amazing. Yeah, he's a very unique character. Um, so take me through the process of writing the book. I mean, you wake up on a Tuesday, you're like, man, I got something here. I want to start writing. Like, what are the next steps? And and, and do you kind of go into a, a story, an idea with w- an idea of what the story should be? Or do you go into it like sort of into an abyss where you're like, whatever I'm going to uncover, whatever I find along the way, you know, I'm going into this blind and just hoping to get the best story out of it. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great set of questions. And it's funny, I don't get to talk about this stuff often enough, which is, which is, which is, uh, which is why I'm glad we're, we're talking, (laughs) you know. I'll, I'll sort of I'll talk about the second part of what you said first because I think it's okay. actually more interesting. Um, one of the things that so this is my third book under my own name, and I've done other books, like meaning sort of as a ghostwriter for other people. And every book is its own kind of dynamic, right? But one of the things that is true across books is like your life is immeasurably improved if you write really good outlines. <laughs> and it's one of these things I always try to convince myself that I don't need to do it or that it's some like exercise for my editor or I'm checking a box. But it turns out that actually like the best books are, at least for me, for my process, the way it starts is I have to get an outline of what the story is going to be, a beginning, a middle, an end, broken out into rough chapter sequences with enough details to be dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, like, if I'm starting from just a blank sheet of paper, you're never going to get anything done. Um, But what I, so what I did was I constructed like a multi-page, I think it ended up being like six or seven pages outline. And it, it basically like was chronological. Like I have the virtue of, I'm not a novelist, so I'm not like trying to make up a story. Yeah. I have a story. My story is late 1998 to late 2002. And then I just have to lay out like, what are the, how do I want this to work, right? Like, what do I want this to look like? And it's essentially like what that becomes is a checklist, right? And so I kind of knew like, I'm going to have 20 or so chapters, give or take. I'm going to have a rough sequence like this. I want to split it up into three parts because like, I don't know, everything's split up into three parts. Like it has yeah. an act one, act two, act three. Um, and then I I kind of had bullets of like, okay, here's, and I I will say part of the reason I did this is because my editor insisted on uh, on me doing it. And she, she was, there was this amazing woman named Alice Mayhew who passed away uh, in 2020. Um, she was, like the editor for Walter Isaacson, for Doris Kearns Goodwin, for some of the historians I really admire. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. And she said, she's like, because I was flailing for a little while on this project. I was really like messed up about it in my head. And she was like, just give me a really good outline. Right. She's like, and I was like, oh, I don't want to do an outline. So I don't like, <laughs> get it because she's asking for it. It was like homework. And it absolutely, it, she was right. It fixed exactly my issue, which is I had no template. I had no roadmap. Right. Yeah. And I was like, okay, here's the story. Here's what I want to do. So that's kind of like, I, in a funny way, I wish I had done that sooner. I probably like saved, like saved years of my life in that way. But yeah. the outline became like the place that I went to to make sure I was sort of progressing. Uh, but that's like the kind of kickoff thing was create an outline and like figure out where to start. Cool. And then how long was the, because you said years, how long was the the research interviews, like that whole process? Yeah, it was five and a half, six years, five and a half years, basically, oh, wow. of, of, of research, interviewing, researching and writing. And that sounds, look, it sounds like a lot, right? Uh, and it is like, it was like, I did not expect to spend that much time doing this. Uh, it's <laughs> a lot of time to devote to one project. Yeah. But what happened is that I had my, I had a series of first interviews with the earliest employees, you know, Max Levchin, Reed Hoffman, Peter Thiel, et cetera. And I would basically learn some new person's name in each of those interviews. Yeah. And then I would reach out to those people. And then I'd learn some more stuff and I'd reach out to those people. Then someone shared five gigabytes of their email from that era. And then I suddenly had like millions of pages to go through. Wow. Then I found that like, okay, I have like all these things, but there are all these like old interviews I can listen to. And so all of it just took like, it was an enormous amount of information but I felt like the only way to do this project was to try to get everything I could, to try to talk to everyone I could. And, you know, I think people have commented about how many details are in the book, but it was because I had just like years and years and years of like work and interviewing and reading things and looking at old things. So that's, that's kind of the, the, like the start from the outline forward. It was a matter of like, okay, I want to interview the earliest board member. His name is John Malloy. Okay, who is this person? Let's like create a little Google Doc about him, right? So I'd like write things about him. Then I would start to like figure out who's the best person to intro him to, to intro me to him, or do I just cold email? And then that process starts. Then I get to sit with him. And then it's like, okay, let me ask you all the questions I've ever wanted to ask you. So is that repeated about 200 times uh, with individuals? And then I had all of this like, YouTube content and old articles that were published about the company. So it was a very like long process, but it was basically like that was the last five and a half years. Yeah, I think that's, I think nowadays people really appreciate it in in an era where everything is instant and people rarely, if ever, fact check to have someone do, you know, all this work for years in a meticulous job and go, you know, through uh, the fine print of everything and try to get the best story out there. I think that's much appreciated. I think that's why people love the book. I mean, I think so. Um, I, I confess that I had models, like meaning models of books that I really admire, that I was studying to understand how to get to this level of detail. Um, There's a really good book about Tiger Woods, actually. It's sort of funny. There's a really good book about Tiger Woods that is super detail rich. And I remember like reading it and rereading it and rereading it because I was so blown away by the depth and like the attention to detail. And I thought to myself, like, I need to write the Tiger Woods biography for PayPal. Like this was like a conscious <laughs> thought I had. And I read it over and over. I mean, I've read that book an embarrassing number of times. Really? Because they just went for broke. You know, they found a letter that Tiger Woods wrote when he was 13 years old to the coach at Stanford, like tracked this like one document down. Yeah. They tr- they found the grave digger for Tiger Woods's dad's grave at the cemetery and interviewed him. Wow. Right. They found like records of everything you could possibly find in a really exhaustive, thoughtful, balanced way. And they really went for it. And what was so interesting about it, and here's actually why it matters. Tiger Woods is one of the most covered public figures in the world of sports. Mm -hmm. Like there's no part of his life that hasn't been like carefully looked at. These two people stroll in, do a biography, and other writers in golf were like, like, yeah, they they, this is amazing. Like they, they got kudos from other people who had written about Tiger Woods, right? That's when, you know, you've really gone for it. Right. And I, you know, I, I wanted the book 
to to not just be the same tired story about you know innovation in Silicon Valley because those books get really boring. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, what if you could find new things or rediscover old things about these people so that some reader like understands who they were when they were 19? I'll give you a great example. This is funny. I don't think I've actually talked about this story publicly before. Oh, we're getting a scoop. All right. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I did is that I, I went to the two places that Elon went to college, which were Queens University in Canada and the University of Pennsylvania. And I ran searches for the word Musk, mm -hmm. just the word Musk, not Elon Musk, just the word Musk. And I went through, I mean, thousands of entries for like the Musk Ox or like some digitized version of music that was accidentally coded with a K instead of a, a an IC, right? <laughs> okay. Thousands, I mean, no joke, thousands. Like I'm sort of like giving away, like, you know, like clicking week after week, just like, okay, let's like spend up, like get up, do another 200 pages today, another 200. And, and I found his campaign platform from when he ran for student government when he was wow. at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, because it was like a random find, like after the 14th entry for the musk ox, yeah. I come across his Wharton campaign platform. Now, what was interesting about it is that he wasn't the only member of this group of people to run for student government. Reed Hoffman actually ran for student government at Stanford and Peter Thiel ran for student government at Stanford. So I, in the book, I put their platforms next to one another, because if you read their platforms, you can sort of like, you get a window into like, wow. These, these people are the same as they ever were, right? They're like the same <laughs> yeah. people. And, and I thought that was just so interesting. But the only way that I could get to that kind of find was like going through digitized records for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and, weeks and trying to really find stuff. And that was like, but honestly, that's part of the fun of it too. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and, and you mentioned Elon. And I think that's probably the guy that stands out the most. He's obviously the most well-known. But, you know, can you talk about who the other, I guess, stars of the book are? And then also why they got labeled as or coined as the PayPal Mafia? Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. Like if people look at the cover of the book, I have some faces you'll recognize and many faces you won't. And if you look at the back cover, it's the same thing. You might mm -hmm. recognize a name or two, but you probably don't know a lot of the folks. I had this, this e extraordinary experience, which is I interviewed people who actually built the company and I would hear about the people who made huge differences or were really exemplary. And so when we talk about the stars of the book, like Sure, you could, you could, and I think fairly argue like Elon had a vision for financial services and how the internet could change financial services that was really powerful. And that's definitely a part of the book. But at the same time, like he hires this guy, Sandeep Lal, who's on the back cover of the book. Sandeep is a big part of the reason why the company is successfully able to get into dozens of international markets, you know, in a very short amount of time. And without Sandeep, you know, that would have been a lot harder. Um, He's, he's aided in that effort by other people. There's a woman named Bora Chung who I interviewed. There was a person named just Scott Bronstein. These are not like names that are going to be on CNBC or CNN or anything, yeah. but they were really, really important to making the company work. A big part of the book is that you will, people, readers will read about like dozens of interesting people, right? Um, there's people also who may not have had like the biggest impact at the company, but they had really interesting lives generally. I interviewed this gentleman who worked at the company for a very brief period. He he is like he's like a business development kind of like very low level employee. I think he might have even been like an intern there. And doesn't love the job. Decides that while he's been working at PayPal, he's been honing up, honing his skills as a magician. So he does magic and decides to leave and become a performer and he's like one of silicon valley's like most sought after magicians now um <laughs> and, and it was a great interview because he actually did magic for me while we were doing this zoom interview he like yeah. did like it was amazing and, but, <laughs> so i i expanded you know what would be called like the the definition of founders or like the even the scope of the project to get beyond just like the headline names um and then, uh, you know, the PayPal Mafia thing is interesting and it's a little complicated. So in 2007, Fortune Magazine publishes a cover story on this group that labels them the PayPal Mafia. And 
it's a complicated issue because there's there's on the cover photo there's only really like 13 or so people and the company is several hundred people when it is in Palo Alto and and in Omaha back at its IPO in 2002 so it's not like the most accurate depiction of of the company the real thing is that the article is not necessarily about the creation of PayPal it's actually about the investments and work and network that were created in the aftermath of PayPal mm-hmm. and so it's about Everything from the making of YouTube, like the alumni of YouTube, the creators of YouTube come out of this group, Yelp, uh, LinkedIn, right? So like all these household name brands actually trace back to PayPal. So the PayPal Mafia article is much more about that than it is about the creation of PayPal. It, it, it is an easy way to describe like what I did, but it's not actually an accurate reflection of the people that I spoke to or the story I told, because in some ways, like there's a, two big reasons. One is... The whole mafia thing, it sounds so sinister, but yeah. I had multiple people tell me like, we did, we weren't, the, like, we're not that cool, basically, basically <laughs> right? It was like, we're, that wasn't, like, this was a payment services company built on the internet. Like, let's not try to make it out into something it's not, right? Yeah, yeah. The other, the other part of it is that um, that photo, you know, that photo doesn't include like any number of people who actually like built the company. And so some of the alumni, you know, played back to me. They were like, look, like, it feels kind of not great to have worked to build this company and then be left out of this this photo shoot. Now, I don't actually think that I think that was more about the way the article was done and the photo shoot was done. It wasn't about like people on the the team trying to like deliberately leave some people out, right? I think some of it was accidental. Like Elon's not in that cover photo. He has a separate photo that's in the magazine article, but he's not actually on the cover. And you would like that's like obviously one of the alumni, right? Mm-hmm. Um so I'm very careful where like, I think the best description of it is actually the PayPal diaspora. And here's the reason why. All of these people go on to do many different things. It's not just in the world of technology. One of the alumni became an ambassador. One of the alumni founded a, uh, an organization called Kiva.org, which is a micro lending finance site. One of them became a professional magician, right? On and on. <laughs> like you have people who, who built and 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 created big things in different industries. They've done movies, they've written best-selling books, right? And so to me that's more of like a diaspora movement than it is a, a mafia movement, right? Yeah, yeah. Um and and I had heard the phrase diaspora attached to the group in a couple of places. And actually it's funny, one year before the Fortune magazine article, there was an there was a writer who called them the PayPal diaspora, but it never stuck. And I think the reason is like, you know, diaspora is maybe like one syllable too many or you know diaspora right yeah it's like one syllable more than mafia and it doesn't sound as like you know i don't know controversial or something yeah but i I would think of them more in that format which is and it's the reason i wrote the book which is like what was in the water when they were all starting their professional lives that led them to that later success what did they learn from the paypal experience why this company as opposed to others and, you know, the questions of that, the answers to those questions seem to be pretty interesting to me. And it turns out they were more interesting than even I thought. Yeah. So, I mean, for people who may not know, because everyone I think knows PayPal, but they may not know the the origins and the story and how PayPal came to be what it was. Can you tell, because originally it was two companies, right? From what, uh, from my understanding, it was two different companies. One was Peter Thiel's and one was Elon's and they kind of came together to form PayPal. So can, can you, you know, tell that story? Yeah, I mean, you did a great dis- description of it there. Uh, oh, the PayPal we very know short today, version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, and I'll do the, the 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 medium size or even a short, you know, the maybe a shorter version. But but basically, PayPal is the creation of two combined companies. Mm-hmm. One company was created in 1999 by Elon Musk. It was called X.com, and his vision was, what if all financial services in the world were stored in one place? Right, meaning you didn't have to go anywhere else to do anything else financially. If you had a mortgage, savings, checking, brokerage, et cetera, all in one place, Mm -hmm. x.com. The other company was called Confinity. It was originally called Fieldlink, actually, and it was created in late 1998 when a young, unknown investor named Peter Thiel decides to invest in an even younger, lesser known figure named Max Levchin. He gives him a $100,000 bridge loan for an idea that Max has about mobile encryption libraries. That product evolves. It evolves to become a product called PayPal by a company called Convinity. Mm -hmm. What PayPal is, is a way for you and I to beam money between Palm Pilots. 
So back in the day, right, in, in ancient times, um, <laughs> there were these, these things called Palm Pilots that were looked sort of like the size of iPhones, but didn't do nearly as much. Yeah. Uh, and his, his Max Levchin's vision and Peter's vision was you have infrared ports on the side of your Palm Pilot. What if we could use those to reconfigure how money operates? And that money became digitized, right? So that you would actually do encrypted transactions over these infrared ports. And one of Max's specialties was cryptography and encrypting. And they thought they could make this work. So it was mobile currency moving on like the one side and like the financial services company to rule them all on the other. And so that those two companies end up merging in early 2000 to create, to, to build the PayPal that we know. Why did they merge? Like, what was the the reason behind it? Yeah, it was a. It, as with all things in this story, it's a little complicated. Um, okay. Basically, the, the the short version of it is, they both find success doing this very specific thing, which is emailing money. Right, meaning users are able to use X dot com's products and Confinity's PayPal product to more easily send one another money over email. That. They both have success, but they end up in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. They are competing for eBay market share. So back in the day when eBay was a, a smaller company, but even still today, you know, they were a, they were the leading provider of digital auctions on the internet. And they hadn't quite fixed the part of their website that was around how do you pay for stuff after an auction's over, right? Like that's actually like a real challenge. Mm -hmm. They left it to their users to sort out their users find x.com's product and Confinity's product and start to use them. But now you're in this battle. They're, they describe this epic weeks-long war between these two companies. So you have Elon on one side and Peter and Max on the other, and neither team is like has slouches, right? Like these are, these are really intense people. They're fighting for eBay market share. And eventually there are leaders on both sides who recognize like, look, we're just burning through money. We're the two biggest players in this space there's real value in a merger here. And it's, like I said, it's complicated, but by hook and crook, they end up coming together to form one company. And that's what unites this, these, these two very, very talented teams. Now it's so rare that you have mergers. Now it would just be probably a buyout. They'd be like, let's, we'll just buy you guys. Just whatever, whatever, whatever the cost, we'll just buy you guys. Well, that was originally what Elon wanted to do. It didn't quite go to his plans, but I'll <laughs> leave those details in the, in the book and people can check them out. <laughs> Uh, I think now we take these things for granted, right? Like now we there's the amount of things we can do in, in on our phones is is unbelievable. But 20 years ago, like uh, you know, online transactions, high speed internet connectivity, uh, social, like all these things just didn't exist. And yet these guys were kind of ahead of the curve, right? They they had the foresight to see what could be and what should be, and they you know implemented to the best of the technology at the time. It's really amazing. And it's a really perceptive point on your part. Like, you know, we're talking as though mobile technology is mobile technology today. Yeah. Right. But at the time, like there was dial up internet. right? <laughs> and like your parents would like, I still can recall my experience of like, oh. I'm on my computer. I'm downloading some like MP3 from Napster and my mom like picks up the phone to make a call and my like saw my like nine inch nails download goes awry, right? Yes, like that's my I, childhood. Was, yeah. It's like, yeah. Basically like 20% of my childhood was frustration about broken downloads. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's a different the, time. The kids just today just they won't understand. No, they have no appreciation for Spotify. They have no, no idea the bounty that they have with that little green logo, right? Like you don't know how much suffering I had to do. <laughs> to listen to grunge music, right? <laughs> <For> free. <laughs> um, and uh -huh. so, so you have that era of computing and you have these people who, including Elon, like in particular, and the reason I single him out on this is when I was speaking to him about why the company was called X.com, uh, you know, he had his thoughts. And then actually an engineer of his shared with me, he said, you know, one of the things that Elon would come into the office and say is eventually a lot of our computing and a lot of our interaction with these devices is going to be on little, like tiny devices, like what we have today. Yeah. And he said, if you have a keyboard that's only an index card wide, how do you think you want to access your bank account information? Do you want to type in bankofamerica.com or do you want to type in x.com, which is five buttons? 
-hmm. right? It, it was, it was, but he's saying this in 1999, right? Like way before you'd ever have like any, any internet, like the kind of internet connectivity we have on phones now, you know, 4G and 5G networks, right? Like none of that is there at the time. It's, it's like these, it's like the Casio Cassiopeia and the Sharp Wizard and like, yeah. the, you know, these like really ancient, but he's thinking that far ahead to say, look, eventually people are going to want short URLs to access their entire financial life. And that's why I want to move in this direction because I'm preparing for the future. It's, it's an extraordinary set of thoughts for that era of computing. What a goddamn monster this person is like, I, I, I cause I, I remember recently I saw something about, uh, oh, who was this? Forget who the journalist was, but Paul something, but essentially it was like 20 years ago. It might've been CNN, maybe someone else, but they were talking about how the internet is a fad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and again, it's, it's, I think it was probably, I don't know, late nineties, early two thousands. A lot of people didn't really know. I, I, I was barely using the internet at the time, but to have that kind of foresight to know like URLs and, and all the different things that Elon was thinking about while you know, people in the media are telling you that this thing is going to disappear in a year or two. It's a fad. Like, it's just, it's just, I mean, that's literally a genius. Well, and, and, and part of it, I think is, um, you know, they were all in Silicon Valley. Mm. So there so were like other it's a people bubble. and other, well, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would describe it as a bubble per se. I, I think that there's an, there's a, there's a special degree of enthusiasm about new technology in certain places, right? This is not like, it's not actually not earth shattering, but pretty obvious point, right? Like mm -hmm. right now it's Austin, Miami, Silicon Valley, still New York, right? There's like pockets, there are pockets elsewhere as well. Denver has a thriving tech scene. Seattle has a thriving tech scene, right? And so there are places where people get excited about the possibility of new ideas and where things that seem like they are a fad actually end up becoming very mainstream. 1990. Eight and 1999 in Silicon Valley, like you could believe that like dating apps were going to be a thing, right? Like, like there were, that was the first iteration of websites devoted to, to helping people couple up, right? Um, that was the first iteration of, of, of things like pets.com, which pets.com might've failed, but we have Chewy today, right? Like, which does like pet food delivery. Yeah. Um, the ideas that were criticized in those years, especially when the bus started, are things that like you and I, as you mentioned, live with every day. Let me give you actually a, a direct example from this book, which is kind of amazing. When Max Levchin and Peter Thiel build the Palm Pilot money beaming idea, there's a publication that calls it one of the 10 worst business ideas of 1999. <laughs> Four years, three years later, that company goes public and then is acquired by eBay, right? And money beaming is not their ambition. But today, Venmo, which is owned by PayPal, is literally a way that I can take out my phone, beam, you know, beam you money, right? Send you money. And it's the same ambition they had. And, and that idea was laughed out of rooms, laughed out of multiple rooms in 1998 and 1999. And so I think there's a way in which like, you know, these things, sometimes they happen by chance, but sometimes these things that are at the fringes, right? like end up becoming like very core to who we are at the mainstream. And what I hope the book does is it shows that that's not accidental. It actually takes people like deciding that that's going to happen, building teams to make it happen, refining products and services and kind of going down a bunch of blind alleys uh, and, and doing the work to make it happen. Because it is, like you said, so easy to take for granted. Um, and I, I hope people read the book and say, you know, like, I should take it a little less for granted that these things exist in the world. Yeah. And I think that's what's probably happening with crypto right now. Like, and I'm not an advocate nor a specialist. I barely understand it, but I do see a lot of people dismissing it. And I, I, and I do see a core group of people who are just believers and believe this is the future. And I think Elon's kind of one of them as well. And I think that's, I mean, you know, more often than not, we're seeing that uh, ideas that are dismissed 20 years ago are, just, are not reality. I could see this becoming the reality in, you know, 10, 20 years as well, 30, maybe, who knows? Yeah, I think probably the same is true. And I'm not an expert in this space either. But if you look at, you know, if you look at electric vehicles, like they were also the subject of a lot of dismissive commentary for the last like 20 or 30 years. And 
one of the big you know players in this industry, Tesla is I think the world's lar- most valuable automaker today. Yeah. And I think more more interesting to me is if you look at battery capacity relative to the cost of battery production, that trend line is moving in a very favorable direction. Yeah. Every single year, our batteries are getting better and the cost to produce them is going down. And the way that even people listening who aren't into electric vehicles know that that is true is that your laptop and your phone hold a better charge today than they did five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Like they've gotten way better. They're not perfect. Nobody's is ever perfect. Like I find myself redlining all the time, right? (laughs) But it's way better than it was two years ago or three years ago or 10 years ago. And so there's a way in which like some of this stuff that seems like science fiction actually has all these like underlying interesting trends that drive the technology in a certain direction. That said, it's not a passive process. Like someone's improving those batteries, right? Like there are massive companies with interesting and smart people helping to make that technology better. And to me like that, I want to, I always want to try to understand that. And I also want to understand like the people who do that sort of stuff, um, particularly those who don't get a lot of uh, press coverage. Yeah, it's it's the same for um, like cultivated lab meat, right? Like I think a burger a few years ago was like half a million dollars, right? And then it went down to like a hundred thousand fifty. Now it's I think around uh, fifty bucks or something like that. It's it's gone way down. So as technology yeah. improves, investments improve. You know, people are on the front line of of a certain industry and they really believe in it. it it's just it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. 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 And and I think part of the challenge is figuring out when you would, when you ride that wave because you know they were right about mobile technology but they were wrong about the timing. Mm-hmm. People weren't going to transact mobily in 1998, 1999. The, the the devices were too the devices weren't secure enough, they weren't fast enough and the internet wasn't fast enough, right? But fast forward to 2022, I mean I, I can't think of certain transactions without thinking of my phone. Yeah. Right. Like, like, in fact, it's more natural for me to use Venmo on my phone than PayPal on a website. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, our phones are everything. I, you know, even if I pay at a, at a, at a, um, you know, at a coffee shop and I pay for my coffee, I use my phone more often than not. And it's not necessarily easier than a credit card. A credit card is probably easier because there's a few buttons I have to press in order to get it and improve it and everything. But it's just, it's in my hand. It's right there. So it's it's just, yeah, convenient. Right. Um, So why do you think PayPal succeed? Because as you mentioned, like there was a a boom bust that, um, that, that, uh, a boom bust, I'm saying, a uh, bust that happened at, 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 around tech at that time. And PayPal succeeded. PayPal persevered. Uh, many other companies did not. And they were in the fintech space as well. They were probably maybe doing similar or, or, or things that were different, but they were in the fintech. Why do you think they elevated and were able to uh, you know, succeed where others did not? What was the differentiator? Yeah. There's a few reasons, and again, I'll, I'll give. I could talk about that for like an, an hour or two. So I'll give the very, very, very short. <laughs> we version. we have time. All right. <laughs> one one. You know, a couple a couple things. The first is, and this is important context. The bottom starts to fall out of the the tech industry, meaning investment money dries up in the year 2000, along with the slide in the Nasdaq and in you know the other indices. In March of 2000, the company closes a $100 million round of financing. So it's a nine-figure round of financing, which is big today, but it was yeah. enormous then. Yeah, They close that round just days before the market starts to go down. So they have enough money to ride out a really hard year. And I had multiple, this isn't my opinion, by the way, I had multiple people in the company play back to me. They said, you know, that round and its timing were the one of the most fortuitous things that happened to us, right? Because it actually allowed us to survive that year. That's one big reason is they had the funding available to survive. The second big reason is that many other fintech players in this space got wiped out because they did not handle fraud on their systems aggressively enough, or they started out by handling it so aggressively that they didn't get user growth. So the thing about building a payment system is actually a payment system is not that hard to build, right? Like emailing money technologically is not that hard. What's really hard is when bad actors enter your system and abuse it and use it for all kinds of crazy things, right? 
PayPal had that same problem. A lot of others did too. Banks did. I mean, multi-billion dollar like legacy banks did. Mm -hmm. PayPal though had to fight those fraudsters in order to make itself successful and in order to stop burning money every month. At one point, they were burning $12.5 million a month. They had like five or six months of runway left. Wow. That, the, that, that money was being burned up due to fraud. And they had to figure out how to fight fraud. And a big part of the book, sort of like, like three or four chapters are just about how do you fight fraudsters? How do you fight like online criminals? Because this is also the first big wave of online criminality, right? And so that's like big reason number two. The third reason that they succeeded where others failed is that they were pretty disciplined and rigorous about focusing on the place where they had success. So we talked earlier about eBay, like eBay being the place where they found an audience. Nobody who built these companies like had this goal in their minds of like, we're going to be the best payment platform for eBay specifically, right? Because yeah. if, you're, if you're trying to build a product, you're not going to build it on a third-party platform. That's just like insane. They have success there, but they double down on the success there. So they build products for eBay auctioneers. They make that process totally seamless. So once they caught a whiff of success, they like completely drove in that direction and really made themselves indispensable to eBay, which leads to in fall of 2002, it's announced in the summer of 2002, but it happens in the fall, an acquisition by eBay eventually. So those are three of the reasons. I would, I would argue there's a sort of a fourth, which is the company had a a general predisposition to solving problems. They had really talented people on the team, people who were hungry, they were aggressive, they wanted to fix things, they wanted to solve whatever was the burning problem at that time, and they worked really, really hard to do it. Yeah. And so that's like not a specific necessary commentary. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of startups like that, but this place was particularly special amid that among that bunch in just the number of like very flexible, fast problem solvers it had on its ranks. I'm interested in in the fraudsters um, thing. Like, what specific frauds were happening on PayPal that de- they had to devote so much of their time, attention, and money to solve? Because now I feel like it's just something we're kind of used to. Like, there's so much yeah. fraud online. Even like I was talking about crypto earlier. Like, uh, you know, about a year ago, I was like, oh yeah, let me get into this whole crypto thing everyone's talking about. You know, I, I got um, I got a wallet and everything, and then one day I'm sitting on my couch and. I'm seeing these transactions happening without me doing anything. And they just cleaned out my whole wallet. So oh, wow. Yeah, it, it was it was like a few hundred bucks. It wasn't the end of the world. But I was like, oh, okay, this is still kind of the Wild West. And I'm just interested at the time, like what was happening. Oh, it, it's actually maybe the, 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 the better question is what wasn't happening. Right? <laughs> um, so the way PayPal grows is in part by giving out sign-on bonuses. Mm-hmm. But their bonuses work a couple of ways. If I give Roy, uh, uh, like if I encourage you through a referral link to sign up to PayPal, you'll get $10, like no strings attached through on your email, through connected to your email address. What's different is I will also get $10 if you sign up, right? Yeah. And so I'm giving, I'm incentivizing both referring and like the referrer and the referee, right? Meaning both sides of the referral process are incentivized. Here's the problem. You only needed an email address to get the money. So you can imagine what happens like at the early, early days, college students build like tons of fake email accounts (laughs) and basically they're like harvesting beer money from PayPal, right? And they're like thousands of dollars worth of these kind of like, hey, let's just create like a bunch of fake email accounts like john.doe32 at (laughs) hotmail.com. Like you have $10 and you get $10, right? Uh. And then we're just going to connect it back to my real account and I'm getting 10 bucks every time these people (laughs) sign up. That's amazing, right? So they had early on, the fraud was minor fraud. It was things like that. It was like people who had maybe a little bit too much time on their hands who needed like a little bit of money. But then they become successful on eBay. So there are these very sophisticated fraudsters who use the system. So like, like it, it, they actually do these kind of amazing, there's actually one of them that's like really elaborate. So they'll create a fake eBay account, put up fake products use a stolen credit card number, tie it to a fake PayPal account, and essentially like launder money over eBay, meaning hmm. like fake item, real credit card, money transfers from one to the other, and they never send an item, but they move the money out from that person, right, overseas where it can like barely be traced, yeah. right? So that that was that was like, so we just went from through the range, which is like, 
beer money to like stolen credit cards. Yeah. Right. And so there and everything in between. So it's not sort of one type of fraudster. It's like a really evolving set of fraudsters, some domestic, some international, some like really professional hacker types, some just like people who like, you know, didn't like maybe didn't know any better or like were like, oh, this is a great little game and then I'm gonna move on to something else. Right. <laughs> um so they face all of this and they're starting to suddenly get interest and not great interest from, you know, Secret Service, the FBI, the Federal Trade Commission, like all these bodies that regulate this sort of thing. But even the bodies themselves, like it's not like there's 20 years of law enforcement experience fighting online crime. This is like a relatively new thing that's happening in the world because the internet wasn't a thing before the mid 1990s. Yeah. And so that is is what they're facing. A it, it is the Wild West. It's like people like there was a there was actually a great story I found. Someone created a copycat PayPal website. Instead of P A Y P A L dot com, okay. it was P A Y P A I dot com, PayPi dot com. And the reason is because on the keyboard, the I is right next to the L. Mm -hmm. And so if you accidentally type in an I, you'd get to the site and it would look exactly like PayPal. And you'd put your credit card information in, and all of a sudden you're like a victim of fraud, right? So they're facing that sort of thing where it's like, everything that you could possibly imagine uh and they have to you know work to defeat it all man the, these i'm telling you these scams like nowadays i get i, I can't i like emails text phone calls social media right like I, i'm seeing more and more people on social media like people who you know have a little bit of a following uh, maybe ten thousand twenty thousand and then they'll almost every day they'll be like Someone opened an account under my name. Don't answer their DMs. They're asking you right. for this and that and the other. And unfortunately, people fall for it, man. Like I see this stuff every day. It's 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 kind of infuriating. But yeah, I don't, I don't know how you fight it. It's extremely difficult. Still, like to this day, they haven't figured out. And now it's more prevalent than ever. So kudos to them for trying to do it back then, you know? Yeah, I, uh, well, I agree with you. And I think it's it's actually one of the things that it could have been the thing that tanked the company. Yeah. And fighting it successfully is the thing that saved the company. You know, there's um. Have you ever watched Silicon Valley, like the the, the show? HBO, HBO show? I watched the first season and then I I kind of dropped off like after the first season. <laughs> okay, it's it's a pretty funny show, and I think they take a lot from a few people probably that were in PayPal and, and just like tech moguls. Um, but there's a scene there that they sit there uh, for hours and run the math to see if dogs smell better than humans. Are they, <laughs> Or are they just closer to the point of smell because they're lower to the ground? And they it's a, it's a very funny scene. And, you know, they run all this math <laughs> for hours. And eventually, after arguing for hours, they realize that actually dogs do smell better. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, was, I always thought it was like a funny scene. But were there things of that nature where – because I've heard you describe the, the people in the company to be very competitive and, and they would just essentially compete over the mundane, right? Just like the day-to-day -day stuff. So were there stories like that where they would just argue or compete over the most random things because they had that competitive spirit in them or the desire perhaps to like, I don't know, prove intellectual superiority or something to that effect? Yeah. You know, there are a lot of stories like that. <laughs> um, Cause it's, but any, and you know, I don't actually, I, you know, Silicon Valley has this like quality of like satirizing that or making it seem kind of yeah, like yeah. random. And I, and look, the show's funny. Like I've, I've watched it and laughed. It's a great yeah. show. Um, it, it's w when I saw it at PayPal, it was, it, in a way it helped me as a writer. And, and I'll tell you the reason why, because the best characters don't know that the things that they're doing make them good characters right oh that's interesting. so so what's normal for them is someone walks into a room tosses out a puzzle and some and the entire team starts to solve it right um just for fun <laughs> right <laughs> so i saw that i had this big catalog of uh images that someone gave me and one of the images is of the cto of the company is working uh, like he's like got a screwdriver and he's like broken open or is repairing like an a remote controlled car, right? Mm. This is like like a CTO like the CTO of the company. They've like gotten you know they're like a big deal at this point and like literally you could tell he's like very engaged in the process of fixing <laughs> this car. So there are things like that that are features of the place. Probably one of my favorite stories was that I had this engineer tell me that in one of the early offices 
they would stay up late and like they had, you know, they had this, when they got into the back of the office, there was like a brick wall next to where all the cars were parked. So like a big brick wall. And they constructed a series of, of amazing PVC pipe guns. And the mm. purpose of the guns was to take potatoes and shoot them through <laughs> at hyperspeed and shoot them against the brick wall and then watch them just like explode into pieces, right? Like really like disappear, right? And I remember his description of this, he got like so excited. And I remember just hearing it and being like, oh my God, that is incredible. Like at two o'clock in the morning, instead of going to sleep, you guys are, are shattering potatoes <laughs> using PVC pipe guns. Um, so there were definitely things like that, but you know, it's it's actually... I think it's too, we're too quick to dismiss that because part of it is if you like solving puzzles, mm -hmm. you also like solving the puzzle of fraud. If you like building elaborate devices to shatter potatoes, you also then have this instinct to build technology to, to take on the person who's creating a million fake PayPal, PayPal accounts. Yeah. So, it comes from the same place. That place is playful. Sometimes it's funny, but it also has this like really sharp edged, problem solving that's very practical right and and i found that in this story again and again yeah it sounds like they were all extremely um inquisitive like they wanted to find answers and and you know as as you mentioned earlier like this company had a lot of big personalities especially yeah. when they merged Peter Thiel, Elon, Reid Hoffman, Max Levchin, et cetera. And, they were, and, and nowadays, like we know them, they're all very different, right? Both politically and personally, especially politically. But was there, did you find like some sort of a common thread that weaved them all together? Like something, like, like you said, like maybe they were all inquisitive or maybe it was something else, but something that a, a through line through all of them that made them as great as they were? You know, there were, there were a couple, it, it, it's hard because I, you know, I, I'm writing about so many people, yeah. so it's sort of hard to like attach like completely common features to that many people. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think there was a baseline level of intelligence, um, meaning like, a, a, and I would say actually a baseline level of curiosity. So it wasn't that everybody had like fancy degrees. I actually interviewed two people who dropped out of high school who are part of the story, big part of the team. Yeah. And it was more a baseline level of like curiosity that was wide ranging. You know, these people, I, I interviewed people who would like quote the Bible and loved films and, and read novels and like all the things that like, you know, from where you wouldn't, you'd expect their intelligence to be maybe like really deep in one subset of stuff, but not this wide ranging. So yeah. I found that I would say the second thing is they, they, several of the people are very, very competitive and competitiveness helps when you're trying to make an, underfunded startups succeed during the dot-com bust. Um, and then I would also say that there was a sense, very few people I interviewed in this story felt like they, they, they had an attraction to other smart people, meaning they weren't threatened by intelligence. They wanted to hire people who were actually like very, very, very bright in very different ways and kind of keep them around because they knew that you could flexibly apply them to different problems. I'm painting with a very broad brush and yeah. not everybody fits every one of those dynamics, but that was definitely, you know, that's definitely one of the biggest things about the place. You know, I've been doing this podcast for about what, two years now, uh, over 120 guests and everyone's very different. And I've learned so much from the guests that I've had on. And I wonder if you, because you you said you've been researching this for five to six years, sitting down, talking to people, you know, doing the research. Did you have any big takeaways or reconfigure certain things maybe in your own personal life or how you view things or how, I don't know, even how you view the, the, the tech space, which, you know, is often being shit on by, uh, by journalists or the media, um, which you're not a part of, I'm aware. But just generally, like, are there things that, change with you over time during this research that you, that you did? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's a wonderful question. And, and I suspect like the best place to kind of to end things on, cause it's probably the most like the thing that it, you, cause you're, what you're asking, there's like a sort of thing, there's a, there's a commentary underneath your question, which is, um, you know, you, you don't just shape the projects you do, the projects you do like shape you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in your process, like interviewing all these people, I'm sure like with the podcast, like you are a different person at the end of 120 interviews than you were at the start. Right. Um, because of things you learn 
for me, one of the biggest things I would say is that I, I maybe absorbed their instinct or their tendency to say like, well, what if we just did it all differently? <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'll give you an example. I actually built a secret code into the book. Huh. And I won't give the details of the code away. Okay. But I took a very common, I'll just say, I took a very common part of the book and I turned it into an elaborate secret code. And I don't think that I would have had the gumption to tell, to ask my publisher, hey, I want to change this thing that you never change in books. Yeah. But I want to change it unless I had spent five and a half years around people whose instinct is like, maybe we can do this better. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it can be, maybe we can do rocket launches better. Right. Uh, and granted, my example is very small and it's very different. But I think I now have, I come away with this idea that, that questioning received wisdom or questioning the, the phrase, like the way it's always been done is actually like one of the most interesting ways to get at something different or something new or to like even just have good stories to tell <laughs> right yeah, um, yeah. I, I i don't know what it is but i but you're right that at the end of it i often ask myself like well what if what if this is like completely wrong like what if we just started from scratch or what if we did this or what if we did that i think that what if is actually there's a lot of power in what if right and maybe I hope that I I maintain this because I think it's really easy to fall back into like, well, this is the way it's always been done. It's very hard to like live your life and to say, well, hold on, let's start from first principles or let's start from like, what is this? Like, that's actually not an easy way to live your life. Um, I, I think maybe I, uh, I adopted that. I also don't want to give myself too much credit. Like, <laughs> like I don't, hopefully I'm a better person on the other end of this book. I think I am, but I think maybe one way is that I'm more willing to question the things that are around me. Yeah. Did, has anyone found that code? If has people emailed you or text you saying like we found it? So far, the first person to do it was actually the CTO and co-founder of the company, Max Levchin, because he's like oh, a okay. code breaker. He's like one of the world. I mean, he's amazing. He's a genius. He yeah. cracked it. Um, there were two other people who have emailed me the right answer to the code. Uh, and they you know, they, I'm, I'm, I'm as impressed by them as they were about the fact that a code was included. Uh, and so it was pretty, it was pretty cool to see it, uh, see it come to life. Well, now I have to, well, now I have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to check it out. Um, Jimmy, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Roy, I, I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun and I got the chance to share some stories. I, have not shared anywhere else. And so I'm, I'm really excited and glad we connected and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. For sure, man. Where, uh, where are the best places to follow you and where can people find the book? Yeah. So I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm not super active, but I'm Jimmy A. Sony on Twitter. Um, with the book, the easiest place to buy it is probably Amazon, especially if you read like on Kindle or, or audiobook, it's available there. And it's called The Founders, The Story of PayPal and the Entrepreneurs Who Shaped Silicon Valley. And then, you know, I'm on LinkedIn and email and stuff, but I'm not, you know, I, I think you're going to learn more about me if you read the book than if you try to talk to me directly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be sure to link everything in the show notes, make it easy for everyone to find you in the book. And again, man, thanks for your time today. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, Roy. I really appreciate it.